Great, so we're live. Hello everybody. Um, welcome to this next in a series of interviews we're doing with inspirational thought leaders from around the globe. Um, so I'm Lawrence McCarhill. I'm one of the founders of the Happy Startup School and we're on a mission to bring more purpose to the entrepreneurship world. And so we're connecting people through events, programs, and also uh, webinars like this. And today I'm joined, or lucky to be joined by Aaron Hurst, who's the CEO of Imperative which is a technology platform that enables people to discover, connect, and act on what gives them purpose and work. He's also um, the author of The Purpose Economy and advises brands on, on how to be more purpose-driven and speaks and writes about all this stuff. So first of all, welcome, Aaron. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, it's great to be here, and I love what you guys are doing because uh, the entrepreneurial experience is uh, so challenging and so rewarding, and it's so lonely, so to find ways to connect people and to be able to have best practices, et cetera, is amazing. Awesome, thanks. Um, so that kind of leads me onto my first question quite nicely, actually, which was, um, <clears throat> I think in the book, quite early on in the book, you, you said that um, humans almost have a universal need to develop themselves, to be part of something bigger than themselves, and also to be part of the community. So do you think that, well, A, does business have a role to play in this, but also, how can we, you know, organizations like ours actually maybe accelerate that shift too? Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a fundamental need. I mean, it's connected to well-being. It's connected to lifespan. Um, it's connected to, like, all the major psychological and health sort of outcomes is having that kind of community. Um, and I would say probably half of what brings us purpose is relationships. Uh, I think we put a lot of emphasis on other things, but in reality, relationships are at the core. So I think it's vital. Um, what is the role of organizations? I mean, I think it's the choice of an organization. I think those that thrive, and you see this in study after study, are those where you know people on the teams internally um, are part of a strong community who feel that sense of safety and that ability to be themselves. Um, I was just talking to a guy who works with you know hundreds of call centers, and he said even in call centers, the groups that are highest performing are the ones where there's sort of that authenticity, there's the sense of openness with each other, they call each other out when there's issues, because um, there's so much sort of open vulnerability within that. Um, I think few organizations have the courage to create that environment, but when they do, um, it's exceptional. Uh, so that's sort of on the employee side. I think on the consumer side, you know, I think what we're seeing is that the information economy has gotten to the point where there's very little differentiation between products. It's sort of things are slightly faster, slightly slicker, um, it's hard to do things that are truly, I think, uh, breakthrough. Um, and we're seeing that a lot in the investment community. There's a fatigue around it. Uh, what we're seeing is that, you know, as part of the purpose economy, there's an opportunity to figure out how to make relationships and community, not the sense of community like I've got 600 friends on Facebook, but real community, um, to turn that into a product. So we're seeing organizations that make true community, true relationships, their differentiator. Um, are finding ways to build greater loyalty with their customers and to be able to provide something much more meaningful than just sort of a, a widget. Sure. And just going back to the point you made at the beginning there about yeah. sort of vulnerability, I mean, it, you know, we're seeing more and more, you know, we were a lot of founders who are really following their passion and they tend to, you know, be, they, their values and their purpose are very aligned to, to what they're doing, you know, day to day. But in bigger organizations, how are you seeing that kind of play out? Because obviously, being vulnerable at work, bringing your whole self to work sounds sounds great, but obviously it's not something that people are particularly used to doing in a big company. So, yeah, how does that work from, from what you've seen? Yeah, I mean, big companies are inherently unnatural <laughs> organisms, right? Like, we're not biologically meant to be in that large of a tribe. Um, I think when you see companies that do it well, they break it down into smaller sort of sub-teams and tribes, and then it's about norms in that group. Um, and if you're an employee at BP or any big company, I mean, you're probably part of several different teams or communities. You're not just part of one. And each of those develops a set of norms. And Google has had a great study out just showing that that ability to um, have a sense of safety being yourself was sort of the thing that really correlated with high-performing teams. So I think it's not necessarily something that an organization does. I think it has to start with each leader, each team, mm -hmm. um, setting that kind of a precedent. Uh, I, you know, there are things an organization can do. Um, obviously, to create that kind of environment, uh, but it really starts at that micro level of a team. Sure, and um, I mean, is, is, do you think there's danger that with this whole purpose economy that people jump on the bandwagon a bit? Because obviously, it's we talk about authenticity and and you know this being a real thing. Is it you know have you seen any evidence that you know people see it as a new campaign? And it's like let's be purpose driven because it's the new thing, it's the new trend. 
Yeah, I, I mean, that doesn't worry me as a danger. I mean, I think I'd rather them get on that trend than a lot of other trends. So that doesn't bother me. I think it's something that's fundamentally tied to a deep psychological need. So I don't think it's likely to be a fad um, and something that just sort of fades. It is based on such a critical need. Um, so I'm not worried about it from the standpoint of it surviving or it being something that sort of continues forward. I think it is such a strong need and there's such a well-articulated uh, set of benefits tied to it. Um, so it's not like a new color. It's not like the newest fashion. Um, I, mean, I think there's also an adoption curve. You look at technology. I mean, we started off with technology with some countries using it, some industries using it, and now it's pretty ubiquitous. So these things also are on an adoption curve, and we're seeing the people that are early adopters, they tend to be more uh, trendsetters, right? Um, and the more cynical populations, the later adopters, you know, usually look to them um, for insights into what they should do next. Mm. And, and so where do you think we are on that curve then at the moment? Would you say we're still at the early adopter phase or was this going mainstream? I don't know. I mean, PwC just did a major study of CEOs across around the world. And it was interesting. I mean, they all pretty much said that by 2020, they see this crossing the chasm into the early majority and becoming something that is sort of dominant. Um, and I think when you see that many CEOs seeing it sort of change that way, when we see companies like PwC, Accenture, Deloitte, these huge consulting firms creating purpose practices, doing transformation work around it, um, when you see sort of um, most of the innovation going on, uh, being around the need for purpose, uh, I think we're, you know, we're really like getting to that point where I think we're not more than five years away from it being critical mass. Mm. And do you think that it needs to come from the, the founders, you know, the people right at the top for this to really sort of ripple through any organization? Or can you see, or have you seen examples of, you know, coming from the ground up? I mean, I think you could, I think there's pieces of it you can do from the ground up. I mean, you can have a product that's done well. You can have a team that's run well. I mean, you can see it happen on a smaller scale. Obviously, it's easier when you have that authentic leadership that's aligned with it um, and is pushing it and is supportive of it and willing to take that risk. So. I think as an entrepreneur, it's something that you know you should be aspiring to. And most entrepreneurs I know do aspire to build that kind of organization. I think at times the experience of being an entrepreneur is so challenging and there's so much failure that it often puts us into our stress mindset. And in our stress mindset, these sort of more human elements tend to disappear. Um, it's one of the interview questions I often ask people is, um, you've told me a lot about who you are at your best. When you're stressed out, how do you change? because we all change and we're stressed. Um, what does the stressed version of you look like? Um, and I think as entrepreneurs, it's really important to note, and I do it all the time, you know, you get in a stress mode and you're sort of, uh, the dark side of the forest starts to emerge and you gotta find a way to keep that in check. So tell me what you like on a bad day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well it's not, it's not necessarily, I mean stress happens. I think it's, uh, to, to assume that it'll never happen isn't fair and I think most people really um, it's a relief to be able to express and to validate that it's okay to have that stress personality as well, as long as you're, you know, have self awareness around it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think we've seen in our community. I mean, it, particularly if you're following your purpose as an organisation, it's it's not easy, right? It's it's actually comes with more tension maybe than just following the traditional path. So, yeah, I we have a lot at stake. Yeah, there's so much at stake, and you know, every product you build, everything you do is like it's your own child. So, um, yeah, I mean, you. It's definitely amplified. Um, but you know, I mean, my wife works at a large company. I have a lot of friends that work at large companies. And there you have a lot of stress too, just because you've got quarterly earnings expectations and other challenges that are very stressful as well. So uh, for startups, a lot of the stress is self-imposed, whereas I think a lot of the stress in big companies is extrinsic. And do you think for, I mean, obviously we're interested in you know the early stages of a, a company with founders in particular. Do you think you know being purpose-driven is an advantage for them in terms of you know um, attracting people to their mission, you know, customers or employees, but also no just, for, you know, for them personally too, in terms of giving them a bit more chance of success. Yeah, I think it depends on your definition of that, Lawrence. I mean, the way I define it and the way we define it from a research standpoint is being purpose-driven is about, um, you know, seeing work as being more than just about a paycheck, um, more than just about status. They're actually about helping people and growing. Um, and I think really strong founders, you know, need to be that way. They need to see their fundamental product is about helping people first and foremost and about um, growing themselves as human beings. And if they don't approach being an entrepreneur with those two goals, you know, I think they could have a successful financial exit quickly. It's possible, um, a good idea, but to build an enduring sort of strong culture, to build an enduring product, to build an enduring customer base, it sure helps when you actually care about serving your customers and 
um, you care about growing in the experience. Because I don't know many entrepreneurs that you know have figured it all out. If you're not constantly growing and learning as an entrepreneur, you're in trouble. Yeah, exactly. It's that growth mindset. Um, and do you think sort of growing fast, you know, that kind of build it, flip it mentality in, in Silicon Valley in particular is is well, is it healthy? But also, is it does it sort of contradict this approach? You know, can they work together? Can you grow fast and you know stay true stay true to your purpose? Yeah, I don't. I mean, there's always examples of yes. I mean, I think I uh, I worked in Silicon Valley in the '90s when it was not about money. It was more about sort of upsetting the status quo and finding new, sort of more populist models for how to get information out there, for how to empower the consumer. Um, I think Silicon Valley has become a very uh, money and status driven culture, which I don't think it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I think it's part of what ultimately will lead to its demise, just like, you know, I think Detroit and sort of the large industrial cities uh, sort of got so full of their own hubris and were so focused on the financial gains and not about innovation and not about truly helping people, um, but they lost their sort of core. Um, so, you know, I think Silicon Valley to me is sort of at the verge, you know, it's on the edge of a pretty major, I think, meltdown, especially when you see how inflated stock prices are and you see how strongly uh, Silicon Valley is uh, developing into a caste system um, around sort of the haves and have nots, just like Detroit was, um, you know, many years ago. So I don't know if it's going to be next week or five or 10 years from now, but it's very unlikely Silicon Valley can with its hubris and sure lack of focus on really adding value, maintain its leadership. And do you see the, the investment world is changing a bit too? Because obviously that's, I would say, where maybe part of the problem has been people have just been chasing investment rather than focusing on impact. So, you know, there's this big movement. Yeah, towards more flood a market with, and whenever you flood a market with money, it creates a lot of irrational behavior. Um, so I think that has definitely been part of it. But I think at the same time you see um, there's an incredible trend where people are leaving less and less money to their kids and they're instead putting their money into philanthropy um, and more and more philanthropic investment. Um, and then there's more and more hybrid between philanthropy and entrepreneurship because so much of what entrepreneurs are doing um, is addressing societal needs um, and social ills. So you're seeing more and more of this blending. So uh, I sort of see both sides happening. One side, it's becoming more Wall Street driven um, and more of that just pure, how do I get returns? How do we turn entrepreneurship into a set agile lean startup process where it's basically a manufacturing model of innovation, mm -hmm. um, which takes sort of the soul out of it. Um, and then on the other hand, you're seeing uh, more money entering the market that's interested in more than just financial gain, that's interested in doing things that really matter. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I think that was our, um, so like our background was we ran a digital agency for about 10 years before we set up the school and me and my business partner were just really frustrated with the, the lead startup approach. We found it really useful, but like you said, it just felt very sort of mechanical. You know, it seemed to yeah. take a lot of the soul out of the, the projects and didn't really look at it at a human level. So and there's so much there that's right. It's just, it's become a dogma. Hmm. Um, and it's almost like it's its, its own religion. <laughs> yeah. any, anytime something gets that way, like it becomes problematic. And I think people have to recognize, I mean, the old model of like investment from the 90s and the waterfall development process was flawed. This model is flawed. The next model will be flawed. Um, they all are sort of learning and building on each other. Um, but it, it loses sort of inspiration and purpose and fulfillment in that process because um, it's broken down into such a manufactured model. It's basically the Henry Ford model of uh, startup software development. And do you think that's about people chasing opportunity more than, you know, something that really drives them? I mean, we've seen it a lot ourselves that people sort of think they're going to build the next billion dollar app, but, you know, they're not necessarily going to see it through when, when times get tough. So it's interesting. Adam Grant's new book, he talks about the difference between entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs and that the old belief was it was about risk threshold and that entrepreneurs are more likely to take risk. Um, what the research showed is it had more to do, as I understand it, with them having a vision for a change they want to make. Um, and are so propelled and sort of overcome um, with the need to create that change that they can't help but sort of make it happen. It's almost like a, a revelation. Um, and they sort of feel a need to make it happen. Um, so I sort of think of that when I'm sort of thinking about that question um, in, in terms of like what's actually moving people. I think part of it too, as you move more and more money into a system, you need to have ways to calibrate risk. So investors are wanting to use a specific process and evaluate whether or not you're using that process because it helps them mitigate risk. And I think you've also got a lot of entrepreneurs 
I mean, there's a, a guy I met, I think he was at uh, the New School in New York City, who studied entrepreneurs and found they had very high rates of mental illness um, themselves and in their family. And that um, there's a level of mental illness that goes into entrepreneurship, and there is a certain degree to which you're uh, uh, um, removed from reality <laughs> and do things that are not rational. And uh, I think what we've done is we've taken entrepreneurship and we've tried to find a way for anyone to do it because everybody went and saw, you know, um, movies about startups. We've glorified, you know, the founders of Google and the founders of Facebook, et cetera. And everyone's wanting to try to play that role, even though they're not really wired to be crazy that way. Um, and I think as a result, they had to create a process to try to replicate um, a process that wasn't truly entrepreneurship anymore. Yeah. And are you finding that, I mean, do you think people can learn these skills? I mean, whether it's entrepreneurship or even being more purpose driven, you know, showing more empathy, do you think that's something that's either hardwired or, or it can be acquired? I think it's like anything, like it's, um, it's like athletics. I mean, it's, I think people can build those skills even if they're not that good, if they work hard enough at it, mm -hmm. uh, but they're going to be very different than the person who's naturally wired that way. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's the difference. Kind of like Carol Dweck's research around mindset as well. In, in yep. that. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a lot of these pieces. I think it's, um, you can do a lot to practice it. You can do a lot to grow. Um, but, it, you know, there are certain people that are wired, I think, to uh, think in terms of an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, an entrepreneurial mindset to me is to see, it's to have visions and to be basically irrationally possessed to achieve that vision. Um, that to me is an entrepreneur, yeah. and not someone who does the agile process. So like you said, someone who's got a deep, it's almost like an urge, a need that they have to get out into the world, it's not optional for them to just keep it suppressed. Yeah, I mean, it's the closest, I'm not a religious man, but I sort of, you know, I've got friends that are Mormons in Utah out here in the US, and they talk about, you know, revelations and like being given a calling from God. Um, I think it's that kind of like sense of being struck by something that um, you just can't sleep until you've tried to exercise it and to show the world. And the more the world says that's not real, the more driven you are to make it real because yeah. you have to get that vision out there. Yeah, it's that kind of um, backlash. Yeah, I think we found that with the, the startup school as a side project. It was a little thing that's bubbling on the side and it just kind of started yeah. growing on its own and wouldn't go away and just nagged at us until we, we gave it our full attention. Because, um, yeah, and I think like this is a good example of something that's purely um, purpose-driven and we didn't have any commercial um, approach behind it at all. So it spent two years building a community and then thought, okay, how can we actually develop this into a business? And yep. it's more authentic as a result of that. No, absolutely. I think that's, it's that balance, trying to figure out how are you serving and then how do you monetize it to make it sustainable and scale. Yeah, exactly. But um, if you started on an agile process, it would have been very different. Yeah, exactly. It's be um, well. Actually, my business partner's a bit more scientific, so he he kind of prefers that route, I think. And I, I just go with gut. So we're a good balance of gut and data. <laughs> um, so one um, little story in your book I really liked was the the tale of two gongs. You talked about um, how two different companies approached how they celebrate the successes in their company. I think it was Zali and uh, Yelp were the two companies you mentioned there. Yep. I think Zali celebrated every time that, um, I can't remember exactly what it was, it was something to do with improving the lives of their, their customers and Yelps was when they, yeah. they hit their targets for an ad campaign. So um, yeah. oh, one thing is, do, 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 do you have a gong imperative? And if so, what, what rings your gong? <laughs> I don't have a literal gong. Um, and you know, I think it's a really important story just about what do you celebrate as an organization. And if you celebrate financial means, you're building a culture where ultimately um, it says, if you get another offer, it's more money, you should take it. Um, it's always about money being the lead. It's not about fundamentally, are you adding value in the world versus are you celebrating you know, the ability to add value in the world? And um, it's been really interesting. I mean, we struggle with that ourselves internally because as a startup, you're constantly watching cash flow. You gotta figure out what's going on. So when you bring in money, it's like, oh my God, it's you know, we'll be able to stay open for another month. We'll be able to stay open for another two months. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a celebration of that ability, but always putting that in check. Um, so, you know, trying to focus more on the stories and we hear about, you know, people writing to us saying they've used our purpose diagnostic and it helped them really uh, figure out what they want to do in their career or how to focus on purpose in their career. That to me is a bigger win than finding out we've closed a deal. Um, so those sort of individual stories are the things that, you know, we use Slack as sort of our gong is to sort of put that message out to the network and yeah. our team.
Excellent. And um, yeah, we actually use that on our on our homeschool, the, the imperative tool, because I think it's a great way for people to, you know, at the early stage, if they're maybe not quite sure of the direction they should take, it gives it seems to really give people a confidence about, you know, what they're doing and why, and, and certainly leads them into a more sort of um, focused. Yeah, and, it's, and it's a good way to, I mean, I think as an entrepreneur, I look at my purpose type um, from our diagnostic, and it very much aligns up with what I did with the Taproot Foundation, now with Imperative. And it's sort of a constant reminder that when we start doing work that's not aligned with that, that um, I need to be really careful because it's not going to the root of what my purpose is. Um, so it's a great way as an entrepreneur, I think, to focus your effort um, and to really figure out, like, you know, the 30 different ways you could go to market, what is the way that actually aligns with who you are? Yeah. So with this tool in particular, I mean, it seems like your purpose here is to help other people find their purpose. Is that yep. true? Well, my, my, I think there's three different aspects. I really enjoy helping organizations uh, more than helping individuals or society at large. Like I love the process of helping an organization thrive because I feel like that's where the magic happens, um, mm -hmm. where people become more than just themselves, but actually there's that, that synergistic um, effect where you know one plus one equals three, not just two. Um, and I feel like organizations are our best hope for changing society, and there's so much need there. Um, you know, and I'm very much about building communities of people who can solve their own problems instead of trying to solve the problem for them. So even the you know, imperative diagnostic tool is about empowering individuals to work together to create broader change. Because uh, I find that when you bring people together and they have shared ownership and self-awareness, um, they're able to have the courage and ability to do amazing things. Yeah, and how do you find that sort of match of individual purpose and organizational purpose? I mean, is that sometimes a battle for people to, you know, obviously if you're a founder or you're leading the team, then you quite care about what you're doing, but to bring everyone with you, um, yeah, any advice for people on that? Yeah, I think it's just important, like, once you know your purpose drivers to, on a daily basis, like, become aware of how those things are happening for you. So if you're individual oriented, that's part of your purpose but your organization is more societally oriented, it's trying to constantly find the stories of individuals, um, constantly going out and trying to interact with individuals to make sure that you stay connected to what you need to be fulfilled. Because your CEO, a bunch of team might be fulfilled helping society, but if that doesn't what really you know, gets you up in the morning, you need to find ways to connect to that part of the organization's impact. And if that's not possible, you probably need to find a different job. Yeah, <laughs> move on. Um, and yeah. Um, conscious of time, so we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, one of the lines I loved in your book, which was uh, when you talked about um, your need to still sort of keep your feet on the ground and stay writing. I think you said even kind of even conductors still need to play, which I love because yeah. you know my background is design, and I I found for a while when I wasn't designing, I was just trying to lead it. I just lost something, yeah. lost lost my left leg almost. And do you think that's important that anyone should do that, or do you think that's just for you know? people like yourself who, you know, may be more creative or feel the need to make stuff? I think most people have that creative energy in them in some format. Um, it may not be visual, it may not be writing, um, but I think it's pretty common to find that people who move up into leadership and management lose track of sort of that on the ground passion that they had. And I think when they do that, they start becoming what we, you know, speak to about being a suit. Um, it's just sort of a hollow suit. And I think it's when you lose when you lose connection to that craft or that caring that drives you at the end of the day. Um, you know, you become hollow inside, and that leads to midlife crises. It leads to all kinds of problems. So, um, you know, for different people, it's different things. I mean, it could be about working with people directly is your craft. It could be for me. I do a lot of doodling. I do a lot of writing. Um, for some people, it's athletics and sort of staying in touch with that. Um, there's different things that help reconnect you to the ground. Um, but finding ways to do that and reconnecting you to your craft um, is critical. Awesome. Okay, final question before we, yes. before we head off. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're looking to grow our community globally. We're trying to educate people, get them to think differently about how they approach, you know, starting a business. What, what do you think organizations like ours can do to, to spread the word out there and get more people thinking in this way? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing, it's like using the adoption curve. It's like finding your early adopters and figuring out how to, you know, turn them into spokespeople. How do you help them? achieve what they want to achieve to create that natural connection. Um, I'm also finding there's so many different amazing programs out there and trying to figure out how to use those as channel partners uh, to be able to reach out and meet new people and provide value. Um, because there are so many entrepreneurs in every city, so many people struggling to find that tribe or community. Um, and there's you know some existing channels to get to them. So I think really trying to figure out who those partners are. Um, we work as a, a great example of an organization. We actually use Office Space for WeWork um, here in Seattle. 
Washington, um, as well as in New York. And uh, it's been incredibly helpful as a network, but they don't provide that kind of content. Um, so, you know, the ability to partner with that layer, I think, is really important. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's measuring, I think it's also just really measuring for your members whether or not you're providing them a purpose, which is a measure of, are you helping them improve relationships? Are you helping them increase their impact? And are you helping them grow? And trying to understand if you're doing those three things, you're gonna be doing well. And if you're not doing those three things, they'll you know jump to something else as soon as it comes along. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, great advice for us and others too, because we're finding a lot of people who are purpose-driven are building communities themselves. You know, like you yep. said, it's not just about a product, it's about building traction with people who care. So, so that's great advice. Awesome, well, Aaron. Thanks a million. Really appreciate you taking yeah. the time out today. And um, yeah, will we see you in the UK anytime soon? I'll be out there in September, I think. So hopefully we can uh, grab a drink or something or do an event together. It'll be fun. Yeah, exactly. And just if people want to follow up with you, it's uh, well, imperative, imperative.com is your, your platform. And yeah, if, my, my email is Aaron at imperative.com. Awesome. All right. Thanks again, Aaron and Ben. Uh, have, have a great day. Fantastic. See you soon.